Hey guys, I'm Natalie and welcome to another edition of Video Notes. Today we're going to be learning about The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne, which was written way back in 1850. Alright, so we're going to start this bad boy off with a spoiler. In other words, I'm going to tell you the whole story right now in 30 seconds or less, so it's easier for you to follow as I get into the details. So if for some unthinkable reason you're actually watching this strictly for entertainment and actually want to see the story unfold, you probably want to skip ahead to the next chapter. Start the clock. The main character of the story is a chick named Hester, who has a baby named Pearl, from someone other than her husband, Roger Chillingworth. As punishment for her sin, the town leaders force her to wear a scarlet A on her chest, which stands for adulterer. Fast forward about seven years, and it turns out one of the town leaders, Reverend Dimsdale, is the father. P.S. No happy endings here. He dies at the end, and so does Hester's husband. Now, I know reading stuff like this can be tough. So I'm going to break it down for you nice and easy. Pay attention because you're going to need to know this and I'm only going to say it once. Then again, you can watch the video as many times as you want. The Scarlet Letter is kind of a messed up story about a woman that gets pregnant when her husband isn't around and she won't say who the father is. The whole town ridicules her for this and, as if you can't see this coming, there's a twist as to who the daddy is. This story sounds like it belongs on Maury. First chapter. Contains little action. Kind of like my last boyfriend. It starts off with a crowd of dreary people outside a wood prison door with iron spikes in 17th century Boston. Think pi pilgrims. <laughs> my life. Think pilgrims. The prison looks like it was made for some serious criminals. And the narrator says that no matter how optimistic the founders were, two of the first things they built were a prison and a cemetery. The one thing out of place here is a rose bush next to the prison door. And this is to remind us of nature's kindness, the condemned. For this story will provide a sweet moral blossom. Chapter 2, Keep Up. A girl named Hester Prynne comes out of the prison door holding a baby and walks onto a platform where she's going to be publicly condemned. The women in the crowd criticize her for a letter A stitched in gold and scarlet on her dress. We can deduce that she has committed adultery and that the baby is from someone other than her husband and that the letter A on her dress stands for adulterer. Scenes from Hester's earlier life flash through her mind. She sees her parents in rural England. Then she sees an old hunchback geeky guy, kind of like my last boyfriend again. But this one she married and followed over to continental Europe. Then BAM! She's back here, and through all this emotion, she accidentally squeezes the baby in her arms, causing the thing to cry. And now she just stands there like, how in the world did this happen to me? Get it? Good? Onward. In the crowd, Hester spots her husband, who sent her to America, but never followed her there. Hester's husband, who is now calling himself Roger Chillingworth, gestures to her that she should not say who he is. Creep. He asks the stranger about Hester's crime. The stranger tells him that Hester was sent to America while her husband remained in Europe to take care of some things, but he never showed up in Boston. Chillingworth, now talking about himself of course, says that her husband must have been foolish to think he could keep a hottie like her happy, and he asks who the baby's father is. The stranger says that Hester refuses to say who her fellow sinner is. As a punishment, she has been sentenced to three hours on the scaffold and has to wear the scarlet letter on her chest FOREVER. Now we learn about the three town leaders who will judge Hester. One is the governor, Governor Bellingham. The other two are reverends, Reverend Wilson and Reverend Dimsdale. Dimsdale, a young, well-renowned minister, demands that Hester tell who the father is. He says that she should not protect the man's identity, but when she refuses, he stops asking. Hester then says that her child will seek a heavenly father and will never know an earthly one. Now the other reverend, Reverend Wilson, starts slamming Hester with the sermon about how she's a sinner. She just kind of bears it, and when it's all done, she goes back into prison. All right, so in chapter four, Chillingsworth tells the jailer that he's a doctor, and with some medicine, he can make her a little more cooperative. So he goes into Hester's cell and offers her a drink. She thinks that Chillingsworth is trying to poison her, but he says, uh-uh, I want you alive, biatch, and don't you dare tell anyone who I am. He says that one way or another, she'll give away who the father is, and implies that he plans to seek him out. He gives his weird, devilish grin, and she's like, oh man, you the devil. 
Clearly, this guy's got revenge on his mind. Now, after a few months, Hester is released from prison. Although she's free to leave Boston, she chooses to not to. She moves into an abandoned cabin on the edge of town, and she remains alienated from everyone. Now, although she's an outcast, she supports herself doing some pretty cool needlework. She's so good, even the governor wears her stuff. And despite her success, Hester still feels lonely, and she searches for companionship, but she's S.O.L. She does some charity work, but pff, even that's brutal. It's really tough being a whore in 17th century Boston. Hester's one consolation is her daughter, Pearl. Now, Pearl's just like her mother. Moody, passionate, defiant, and mischievous. Kind of like most women. The exact opposite of Puritan belief. Pearl is aware that she's an outcast and different from others. And when Hester tries to teach her about God, Pearl says, I have no heavenly father. Because Pearl is always with her mother, people are mean to her also, especially other kids. Knowing that she's alone in this world, Pearl creates imaginary friends to play with. Crazy kid. Pearl is fascinated by the Scarlet Letter and seems to intentionally torture her mother by playing with it. Now, at about three years old, Pearl asked her mom where she came from. This makes Hester wonder if Pearl might actually be the demon child that the townspeople say she is. All she had to do was lie to the kid. Hester and Pearl go to Governor Bellingham's mansion, and on their way there, they're attacked by a bunch of kids who try to fling mud at them. Now, Hester's going for two reasons. One, to deliver a pair of gloves she made, and two, to find out if there's any truth to the rumors that Pearl may be taken from her. Now, the people are making up all kinds of excuses as to why they should be separated. The governor's mansion is all stuffy and aristocrat-like, with family pictures and a suit of armor and junk. Pearl is fascinated by the armor. But next thing you know, she starts screaming for a rose from the bush outside. Then she just shuts right up when some men arrive. Now, Governor Bellingham, the two reverends, Wilson and Dimsdale, and her husband, Chillingworth, enter the room and start teasing the little kid. They start calling her bird and demon child real mature. The governor points out that Hester is sitting right there, and they ask her why she thinks she should be allowed to keep her kid. She says she'll teach Pearl the lesson she learned from her shame. They totally doubt that. And Wilson drills a freaking three-year-old on religion. Pearl's all like, I don't got to answer to you, and pisses them off. Hester begs Dimsdale for help. He says to the other guys that God sent Pearl and that the child was meant to be both a blessing and a curse. Totally sweet-talking Bellingham and Wilson. And they agree not to separate them. Now, Pearl seems to like Dimsdale. Go figure. Chillingworth, though, asks the guys to reconsider, but they get all holy on him and say, God will determine when the right time to reveal that info is. On the way out, Hester is approached by the governor's sister, Mistress Hibbins, who wants Hester to go to a witch's gathering. Now, Hester just won back her daughter and says no and goes home. Basically, the narrator is saying here that it seems Pearl has saved her mother from Satan's temptations. Funny little turn of events, guys. Chillingworth has taken on the secret role of the doctor, which the community totally embraces. And at this point, Dimsdale starts getting sick and suffers from chest pains. Chillingworth convinces Dimsdale to be roomies. Now, at first people thought Chillingworth was this divine miracle designed to help Dimsdale. But as time passed, rumors start spreading about Chillingworth's past, and the creepiest part, his face starts looking all evil. Now, everybody starts to think that Chillingworth is the devil come for Dimsdale's soul. Now, Chillingworth is obsessed with trying to figure out what's going on with Dimsdale. One day, they have a convo about sin and confessions and burying one's secrets. While the dudes are talking, they hear a cry from outside, and they see Pearl dancing in the graveyard and hooking burrs into the letter A on Hester's chest kid's weird. Chillingworth uses the A to try and get Dimsdale to talk, saying how at least Hester doesn't hide from her secrets. Chillingworth is annoying Dimsdale about what's bothering him, and finally Dimsdale just snaps and tells him to back off. Now, Chillingworth is really suspicious, and a few days later, Chillingworth sneaks up while Dimsdale's sleeping and looks under his shirt. Chillingworth starts getting excited about what's there, but Unfortunately, at this point, we're not supposed to know what the guy found. 
Chillingworth starts playing mind games with Dimsdale, but the guy's pretty much torturing himself anyways. He starts giving sermons on sin, and at night Dimsdale has visions and even dreams about Pearl and Hester with her A. In the vision, he points to the letter A and then back at his own chest. Mentally tormenting isn't enough, and the guy starts beating himself with a whip and even starving himself. Then the guy decides to get on the same scaffold that Hester suffered on, and he just stands there in silence for a while. So most of the townspeople are at a funeral that night, so no one sees that Dimsdale is standing on the place where only sinners are supposed to be. But Pearl spots him, and her and her mom, Hester, join him on the scaffold, and they all hold hands. This actually makes Dimsdale feel better. Pearl asked Dimsdale if he'd stand there with them tomorrow during the day so that everyone can see them. But the guy just shuts her down and says he will on Judgment Day, whenever that is. A meteor shoots through the sky, and ironically, it leaves the letter A in red. Now guess who shows up? Chillingworth, straight creeping. Dimsdale looks at Hester and asks who the guy really is, but she's sworn to secrecy, which apparently they take seriously back then. What's funny is the next day, after Dimsdale gives his best sermon yet, someone comes up to him, hands him his glove found at the scaffold, and says uh, that the devil must have put it there. Then the guy starts talking about how the meteor in the sky lit up an A, clearly as an angel, and it obviously meant that the guy from the funeral is an angel in heaven now. All right, chapter 13, and this one's pretty quick. Time passes, Pearl's about seven, and Hester is a little more accepted into society now, though people still talk crap occasionally. Hester's not really passionate anymore, just kind of a shell of her former self, and she thinks something's seriously wrong with her daughter. Hester's also thinking that she's hurting Dimsdale by not telling him who Chillingworth really is. Now in this chapter, Hester and Chillingworth come face to face, and from their conversation, we figure out the big secret. Chillingworth knows that Dimsdale is Pearl's father. That's right, Dimsdale was the one fooling around with Hester. Hester just wants Chillingworth to leave Dimsdale alone, and the narrator points out that Chillingworth has transformed completely and looks like pure evil, which is pretty much because he's trying to get revenge and has lost his human heart. Now the two argue over whose fault it is, and Hester just comes to realize that she hates Chillingworth and was never happy with the guy anyways. Walking away, Hester goes to pick up her daughter Pearl, who decided to put seaweed on her chest in the shape of an A. Hester's trying to see if Pearl knows what the A really means. Now Pearl knows it has something to do with Dimsdale and the fact that he always clutches his heart whenever he sees them. The kid's pretty perceptive, but she's too young to know, so Hester doesn't tell her. Alright guys, there's an important quotation in this chapter. I'll read it verbatim. Mother, said little Pearl, the sunshine does not love you. It runs away and hides itself because it is afraid of something on your bosom. It will not flee from me, for I wear nothing on my bosom yet. The narrator is just pointing out that the sunlight doesn't hit Hester, but Pearl's just playing around in it. Pearl and Hester are in the woods, hoping to come across Dimsdale. Apparently he takes this sketchy path through the woods. Hester finally wants to tell her lover boy who Chillingworth is. And while they're waiting, Pearl starts talking about the black man, which is just what they call the devil back then. The girl is going on about how she heard some witches and an old woman say that Hester's scarlet letter A is the mark of the black man. Dimsdale is about to approach, and Hester finally gets Pearl to just run off and give her some privacy. But we hear the girl wonder aloud if the minister clutches his heart because the black man has left a mark there too. Chapter 17 is so short and so sweet. Hester and Dimsdale finally get to talk. Now, after hearing that Chillingworth is Hester's husband, he blames Hester for all of his suffering. It takes a while, but Dimsdale finally forgives her and realizes that Chillingworth is the bad guy in all this. The two former lovers start talking about sailing away to Europe where they can live with Pearl and be a family. <sighs> you know, it wasn't so bad with my ex. All right, there's another important quote here about how shame has impacted Hester. Don't worry, just check out Important Quotes Explained in Spark Notes for more information. Back to the story. Deciding to run away together makes them so excited. The sun starts shining everywhere and Hester takes off the scarlet letter and turns back into her former passionate self. Hester is so happy, she calls over Pearl so the girl can finally get to know her father. 
Pearl won't even go near her mom until Hester puts the A back on her chest and acts sad again. She does it, and the girl finally runs over, kisses Hester, then kisses the scarlet letter. Weird. Then she gets a kiss on the forehead from Dimsdale. Now, Hester hasn't told Pearl the good news yet, but she's aware that something's going on. So the girl asks Dimsdale if he'll hold hands with them and walk into town together. He shuts this down, and the girl freaks out, runs to a brook, and starts trying to, like, scrub off the kiss from her forehead. In Chapter 20, Hester, through her charity work, makes friends with the crew of a ship going to Europe. So, her and Dimsdale plan to run away on it. Sail away on it. Dimsdale starts acting strange, though, even to himself. He wants to shout these blasphemous things and has this urge to start swearing in front of kids. He tells Chillingsworth that he doesn't need any more drugs to help his health, and he even thinks he may have made a bargain with a devil when he was talking to the infamous Mistress Hibbins. Anyway, election day is coming up in three days, which was apparently a religious and civil holiday back then, and Dimsdale's supposed to write a sermon for it, but he winds up throwing out his old manuscript in a fire and writes an entirely new one. This ought to be interesting. Everyone is gathered in the marketplace for the holiday. Pearl is wondering if Dimsdale will acknowledge them in public again, and Hester is fantasizing about finally escaping and being happy. Her dreams are shattered when one of the sailors comes over and talks about how Chillingworth, now remember, he's still technically her husband, how he's going with them because the ship needs a doctor, and Chillingworth decided to tell the captain that he was part of Hester's group. Hester looks over at Chillingworth, and the jerk is smirking at her. There's another important quote here, guys, so go check out the important quotations explained. This one just says that Hester is still trying to tell Pearl to shut up in public. At the gathering, Dimsdale walks on stage, and everyone notices that he looks so much healthier, which for some reason makes Hester doubt their plans even more. Mistress Hibbins, that witch, comes over and starts talking about Dimsdale, telling Hester that she knows who serves the black man, and says she knows about Dimsdale's mark, and that everyone is going to see it soon. The witch also says that the devil is Pearl's father. She goes on, but the narrator actually cuts off the story to let the readers know that Mistress Hibbins is going to be executed as a witch. I'm glad he slipped that part in. Pearl comes back over to her mom with a message from someone from the ship, saying that Chillingworth said he would make sure Dimsdale would get on board, and Hester should only worry about her and Pearl. Hester is definitely worried now, and she realizes that everyone's staring at her. Dimsdale finishes his sermon, where he talks about the relationship between God and the communities of mankind. He says the people of New England will be chosen by God. Everyone is moved by the sermon, obviously. They say it was his best one. As the entire community is leaving the meeting hall, Dimsdale calls Hester and Pearl up on stage, and now everyone turns around and starts staring again. Dimsdale leans on Hester for support and starts confessing. He tells everyone that he's got a red stigma, like Hester too. Pearl finally goes over and gives him that kiss she kept talking about. Dimsdale says goodbye to Hester and then just dies. They're about to have a happy ending and he just dies, like no longer living. And then he, there's not, nothing, he's gone, just on the stage. He was healthy, now he's not, now he's dead. The story's over, except for the conclusion. Here's the last important quote, so go check it out. It's saying now that people aren't hating on the Scarlet Letter anymore, but instead looking at it with some respect, sadness, and some regret. Finally, we're at the conclusion. The narrator talks about how everyone ends up, and there's a discussion about how Dimsdale died. Some people think Chillingworth poisoned him, or it was due to self-torture, or from the minister's inner remorse. There's also a group that says they saw nothing on the guy's chest, and his big revelation was just that any man, no matter how holy or powerful, can be guilty of sin. The narrator points out that it's probably Dimsdale's friends saying that to protect his reputation. Good guys. Chillingworth has nothing to do anymore but waste away and die, and apparently he leaves a huge inheritance to Pearl. Way to go, dad. Not her dad, but Hester's husband guy. 
Hester and Pearl just disappear, and the story of the Scarlet Letter grows into a legend. The town actually preserves the scaffold Hester was punished on, and her cottage as testaments to the story. Hester goes back to the cottage a few years later, and by the time she dies, the A on her chest has lost its bad reputation. She gets buried relatively close to Dimsdale in the King's Chapel graveyard, which is a holy burial ground. They share a headstone with a symbol that sums up the whole book, a scarlet letter A on a black background. So let's recap this puppy. You start off with Hester. She has a baby named Pearl, who is not from her husband. Say it with me. Roger Chillingworth. She's condemned for this sin by being forced to wear a scarlet letter A on her chest. Time passes and Roger Chillingworth, posing as a doctor, torments Hester as he tries to figure out who the father is. Ultimately, we learn that, wait for it, one of the town leaders, a reverend, is the father. And just as he reveals the truth, ready to run away with Hester and Pearl, he dies. Alright guys, that's a wrap. Thanks for checking out video notes on Scarlet Letter. Hopefully you guys do a little bit better on your tests and papers. Good luck.